You hear a lot about the salary cap. We have the salary cap in this league. $41 million cap hit. Long-term extension. Restructuring. Negotiation. Signing bonus. Moving money around for salary cap purposes. But what exactly is it? How do they calculate? I'm just telling you the math part of it. What options do teams have if they go over it? Can I get a redo? We'll cover all that and more here on NFL Explained, the salary cap and contracts. You're gonna have to explain that one. You're gonna have to explain that one. The salary cap is a, a big number, usually big in the hundreds of millions, that describes how much teams can actually spend on players in a given year. So usually you can rely on stadium income and the TV deals. It's a very complicated formula. If somebody told you it was gonna be hard, would you still want it? Pretty much everything about the cap is complicated, but let's begin with how it's calculated. Give us the numbers and let us begin. You start by multiplying the league revenue by the CBA percentage, which in 2021 was 48%, to get the player's revenue share. Let's go get it, let's go get it, let's go get it. Subtract the projected cost of benefits from that, then divide it by the number of teams, and that is how we reach the number of each team's salary cap. It's gonna be a long day. Don't get nervous. Yeah, I, don't get bored on me out there. But the NFL didn't always have a cap. It first took effect in 1994. The first cap was set at just $34.6 million. <laughs> Damn! Since then, it has gone up almost every year until 2020 when it reached $198.2 million. We just get started! <laughs> We gotta love it, let's go! I like this type of party. 2021 was only the second time the salary cap has ever gone down because of the decrease in revenue in 2020. Sometimes the universe is just against you. Not only do teams have to stay under the cap, they also have to stay above the minimum, which is 90% of the cap. If we need some more, we need some more. If a team fails to meet that minimum, they could be subject to fines, canceled contracts, or lost draft picks. No, 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 no! Also, all teams combined must spend an average of 95% of the cap or pay the remainder directly to the players. Give me everything you got and let's see what happens. So, how do teams get under the cap when they're tens of millions of dollars over it? The most obvious answer is cutting players. Another interesting move for the Houston Texans, they've released running back Duke Johnson. Because we're going to see in the next couple weeks a lot of veteran players get cut because of the salary cap constraints these teams are under. What? That's how football goes. Ebbs and flows. You're not wrong. But it's not always as simple as cutting a player and getting back everything they'd be paid in the future. What am I supposed to do with it? Contracts can get extremely complex with all kinds of bonuses, incentives, and guarantees. A one-year deal. $9 million fully guaranteed. A $4 million base salary. What the CBA is going to look like, what the new TV deals are. There are guarantee mechanisms, basically rolling guarantees and a $15 million roster bonus. What? What is this? Help is on the way. All this sort of gymnastics are handled by someone whose job it is to manage the cap. And I would say the public almost never has any idea who this person is. A lot of times they're lawyers. I would say sometimes accountants, but they are some of the most important people in any organization. They're just anonymous because they rarely get press conferences. Um, but this is a role that is crucial, crucial to a team, especially in a year like, say, this year, uh, in 2021, where the cap is going to be a little down. Every team sets up their salary cap structure differently in terms of who's overseeing it. Ultimately, it comes down to the general manager and the head coach, but there's usually a group of people below the general manager. There's different titles for those positions. Some people call them salary cap managers, salary cap analysts, directors of player administrations that help track and strategize their own player spending and evaluate other trends by teams across the league and how they manage their caps. The Chiefs announcing today that they signed Patrick Mahomes to a 10-year contract extension that'll keep him with the team until 2031. The deal is worth up to $503 million. Generally, when contracts are first released, what agents want to do and what players want to do is they want to talk about the maximum possibility of a contract. So for instance, you have a five-year contract worth $100 million. 
but on the base portion, it may only be an $80 million contract, but there's an additional $20 million of incentives that are likely difficult to earn. They'll include going to a Super Bowl, winning a Super Bowl, being a Super Bowl MVP. So they look like they're part of the total package, but the devil is in the details and the truth is in the details of a contract. Let's take the Patrick Mahomes deal, for example. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. He signed a 10-year contract extension in 2020 worth $450 million, including $123 million in base salary. A lot of pancakes, a lot of syrup. But that doesn't necessarily mean he'd be making an even $12.3 million a year in base salary. Wow. Wow. Instead, teams tend to backload contracts so that they free up cap space in the short term, as well as provide insurance in case the player's performance declines or they're injured. Brutal, man. Brutal. Mahomes is slated to earn $85.5 million of his $123 million total base salary during the last three seasons of his 10-year extension. It is a fascinating deal. They gave him a ton of money, over $500 million, but it's a very, very long-term deal, hoping that at some point that becomes a really good deal for them, even though it's a lot of money for Mahomes. But at the same time, players are often given a signing bonus, which in Mahomes' case was $10 million all up front. That was kind of sweet. <laughs> that kind of a big money hit may seem like it would blow up the salary cap, but it's actually spread out over the life of the contract or prorated so it's beneficial to both the team and the player. That's double dip, double dip. All bonuses, including the signing bonus, plus the base salary, equals the cap hit on the team. Hey, game not over. All right, job's not finished. Let's go. There are also guarantees in some players' salaries, which is a portion of the money that must be paid to them whether they get cut or not. And then you have injury guarantees, which a player may get it, may not get it. But if he is injured, it protects him. So let's say a player is guaranteed $10 million next year for injury, and then he tears his Achilles or something like that. They can't cut him without giving him that $10 million because it is guaranteed for injury. In 2018, Kirk Cousins famously held out to sign the first fully guaranteed contract with the Minnesota Vikings for three years at $84 million. Yes! 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 Kirk look good out there. So cutting a player, even though they're due a lot of money, may not actually save much cap space. Ooh, I like it. You like it, I love it. For example, when a player is cut before the end of his contract, the prorated signing bonus will be accelerated, resulting in what's called dead money. If you subtract the dead money from the cap hit, that'll give you the actual cap savings if the player were to be cut. How did he do that? I don't know. Sometimes the amount of cap savings can significantly change by just waiting a few months in the offseason, though. June 1st is a lesser known but very important day in the NFL, especially in 2021. Well, June 1st is really a time when teams can essentially start over accounting for the next year. Players cut before June 1st will have the remainder of their prorated money fall into the 2021 cap, but players cut after it will only have the 2021's bonus money fall into that cap, while the rest will be added to the 2022 cap. Yo, he is a magician. I'm convinced. So let's take Todd Gurley, for example. He was cut by the Rams after June 1st back in 2020, which created $11.8 million in dead money for the 2020 cap and $8.4 million for the 2021 cap. But had he been cut prior to June 1st, it would have created $20.2 million in dead money, all for the 2020 season. Make sense? Uh, I still, I'm just tired. That's all. I'm just tired. It ain't over yet, boy. It's not over. It ain't over yet. Just to make it even more confusing, each team is able to designate two players as June 1st cuts as early as March when the new league year begins. This allows them to free up cap space for the draft, as well as give the cut players more time to find a new team. Hey, that means a lot to me, bro. You can designate a player post June 1, split the dead money up, give yourself a little cap relief this year, and have to deal with it into the future. Obviously, none of the teams had been thinking that the salary cap would decrease when making multi-year contracts with players prior to 2020, 
So one of the most common tactics in 2021 is simply restructuring contracts to ease their cap hits. Hey, tell them you're underpaid. No, no. Tell them you're underpaid. The Steelers announced Thursday they have signed Ben Roethlisberger to a new contract for the upcoming season. Roethlisberger and the team previously announced they were willing to work out a creative structure on his current deal. This involves another round of negotiations with the players and their agents, but the hope is that it allows them to retain key players without going over the cap. So Tom Brady's always held up as an example of a player who looked to be taking less in order for there to be more salary cap dollars available. We renegotiated his contract and we got to this point where Brady, outside of the negotiation, came to me. He said, listen, if I decide to take less money, do you and Bill and the Crafts promise that you will take the dollars that I leave on the table in order to maybe go out and sign more good players and keep some of the veteran players that we already have on this roster. And Tom truly gave us a several million dollar discount that really helped us sustain the talent level on our football team. Finally, any money that is unused one year can be rolled over into the next. I need it all, I need it all. And what that is in essence is if a team is finishing a season and they have say $2.5 million of cap space, what they can do is they can define to the league, they want to take that $2.5 million and roll it over into the next season. No, that was completely legal. In some states it might not be, but. As we said, this can get pretty complicated, but hopefully now you have a little better understanding of the whole process. That was exhausting right there. And why it's so important to each team's structure and strategy. Hey, they didn't say it was gonna be easy, but we got it done, you hear me? What do you think? Is it better to try and build a perennial contender or mortgage the future and go all in one year for a chance at the Lombardi? We'll let you sort that out in the comments section below. <laughs> Peace.